I was lucky and unlucky in a way. Um, when we arrived here, uh, we didn't have one single plant growing in the garden. The developer who um, bought the house obviously wasn't a keen gardener and didn't like the plants because they got rid of e absolutely everything. It was a luxury in a way for me because I could fill this garden with all the propagated plants, but you get to the point where you run out of space. That's for sure, especially if you propagate like me, and, I, I, and I'm sure you will understand the greediness. You know, there's always, I want, it, I want more plants. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 116 of Talking Dirty. Over at East Ruston Old Vicarage, looking beautiful in dark blue, we have Alan Edward Herbert Gray, our happy and very handsome horticulturalist. And beaming her way from Cambridgeshire on this wet and horrid morning. Do you know, it's been raining here at East Ruston for over 24 hours. It really has. It is, um, shall we say, we all got soggy bottoms, which is not a nice state to be in. Anyway, Cambridgeshire, we have thought is Maria Sophia Fredrickson looking absolutely blooming. You look so cheerful. And I mean, we need to do this, don't we, at this time of the year. I was in the kitchen this morning just as it was getting light. Um, yes, I do get up that early. <laughs> And the birds were singing. We had a sort of start of a dawn chorus. It's not the full dawn chorus yet at the, at the moment, but there was a blackbird outside singing. And I thought, who needs a radio on when you've got that to listen to? It's fantastic. Today's guest is an absolute favourite on Talking Dirty because of the bounty of beautiful plants he brings. Tim Simon Fuller of Plantsman's Preference, based in South Norfolk, where I believe you've also had a bit of a deluge this morning. Welcome back to Talking Dirty and thank you for braving the rain to get all your plants ready for today's podcast and managing to dry out, hopefully, before you sat down to talk to us. Yes, as actually looking out the window, I'm quite pleased to be inside just at the minute because otherwise I've been full waterproofs again, working outside, trying to get everything ready for reopening in March. So, um, yeah, wet enough yesterday. I don't need quite more of it just yet. Quite the season. I saw pictures of you experiencing quite a strong, uh, quite a hearty frost um, earlier in the season. And there's obviously been plenty of rain as well. So challenges are plenty for a nurseryman. Yeah, it's, I mean, as winters go, it's not been bad so far. You know, it's generally mild. Um, it makes it easier to get on with stuff anyway. Um, but yeah, the, the rain at the beginning of January was probably got the nursery to the wettest it's been in the 22, 23 years we've been there. Um, we had standing water in places I've never seen standing water before, but give it a week and it's all drained away reasonably well. But by four o'clock yesterday afternoon we had great stretches of water again so it didn't take a lot and yeah with this morning it I think, I think the thing about that is that once the ground is saturated it's saturated oh, yeah. and it, uh, although it's, it disappears a little bit you know that upper layer comes up that bottom layer of water comes up again well where we are we've got about two feet of sandy loam but that sits on top of solid boulder clay yeah so what happens in the autumn you get typical autumn rain comes in it fills yep. up the water and it can't escape below it so it we're on a slight slope so it just has to percolate away over time but well i think you're probably you're probably away. lucky from that point of view that you're on uh, you're you're halfway up a slope if you like because i mean i know where your nursery is and and it is slightly uphill and then you turn right or left yeah. depending on where you're coming from <laughs> yeah yeah um, we, just off the top of the hill, really, and it yeah. it takes its time. But the problem is, it comes out the sky quicker than it can drain away. Yeah, <laughs> I was very interested to see after the wind that we've had a picture of your nursery when you said, "I think more hedges are needed," <laughs> <laughs> because the winds we've had have been terrific, haven't they? Oh, and you know what the nursery's like. I I always say if there's a a breeze somewhere, we've got a gale. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I used to say the same about the garden here in the in the early days, Tim, because I used to say if there's a breeze in Norwich, there's a gale at East Ruston. But I, it's no longer true. I mean, it, you, you hear the wind and there are places in the garden, obviously, where it hits. But there are an awful lot of sheltered places where you can sort of you still hear the wind and you just think, how is this possible? And the air is not moving down here where I am. Yeah, we, We've got it to the point now where from most directions, the wind isn't a problem. Hmm. Uh, it's there's one particular angle towards the northwest that it can still sneak through mm. and the southeast and south are actually the uh, the main problems we have now which tend to be those 
those really annoying hot summer winds that suddenly yeah. come out mm. of nowhere. Yeah. Um, but no, for the winter or autumn winter winds, we're we're much more protected than we used to be. Main thing is to grow plants that don't need staking. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, I suppose I suppose there's lots of people. That, that, I mean, you know, if you think about the plants that you can Chelsea chop or Hampton hack and all that kind of thing, that does help to stop the need for staking, doesn't it? A bit. Uh, it's one of the main reasons for doing it. You re reduce yeah. the weight a bit, so you you stop them from getting so tall that they get blown over. Or just uh, just tell everybody how you do it. Well. Um, we never do it at Chelsea time for a start because that always seems to be the wrong time. Um, but we usually, with things like asters, helianthus and that, wait till they get about a foot high and then cut back by between a third and half, depending on sort of how soft the growth is. So generally, the softer it is, the harder it tends to go. Um, yeah. Some things we just pinch tips out. Um, so you just take a couple of inches out the top. Um, then there's a few things that you can do a bit later, um, so they, they might not be done till June or so, and you, you just take off the, the first flush of flowers. Some of the, the hardy herbaceous salvias, like salvia nemorosa and that, you get first flush of flowers in May, June, and then end of June, we kind of chop those off. We know that they take five or six weeks to reflower, and some of the hardy geraniums are the same. Yeah. So, We've, we've had customers before now who, um, one in particular, I remember, they were holding their daughter's wedding reception in their garden. And the year before, they were putting lots of extra planting in so the garden looked rather better than it already did. And they put loads of salvia caradonna in. But this wedding reception was in like the middle of August or something. And they were worried that it wouldn't be looking at its best. So I said, well, look, cut it back six weeks before the day. And you should pretty well guarantee that it will be looking pretty good for that day. And well, uh, very thankful for the fact that it worked pretty well. And I, I saw some photos. <laughs> I of bet it. they had shaky hands when they were doing the cutting. <laughs> well, it's always a bit of a gamble because weather and plants, I mean, they say don't work with pets and children and um, weather and plants are nearly as bad, I think. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Now, what always happens when we talk to you, Tim, is we run out of time or, you know, we run out of time to cover all the plants that we want to talk about. So I, <laughs> I, am, shut up. <laughs> I am keen to embark on your show and tell before we get digress, you know, before we digress any more. Yeah, uh, let's I, I know you have so many wonderful things to, to share. So where would you like to start with your show and tell today? Well, I'm conscious of the fact that there are people who know a lot more about snowdrops than me, but it's that time of year, so I thought it'd be silly not to include a couple. Um, I'm probably going to have to argue with them now, but um, this was one which went onto my wants list as soon as I saw it. And I've got a spider abseiling off it as well. <laughs> um, this, as soon as I saw a photo of it, I knew that that would go on my wants list because I've always had a thing for these ones that get called virescent snowdrops where they have green on the outer i'm going to say petals they're probably tepals aren't they um as well as the inner so this is quite a, a sort of modest one and it fits my taste perhaps more for the graceful types as well um so this is galanthus nivalis allen's treat oh. um which i thought was particularly worth mentioning at the moment since um allen's no longer about but it's I mean, it's bulking up well. This I'm growing it in a long time pot here because I haven't found anywhere in right to plant it yet. But that's gone from one bulb about six years ago to that lot. So that's this another a huge clump. I mean, if you're listening to the audio version, how many blooms are we talking about? It looks like, I don't know, 30 or something. 30, 40, yeah. yeah. I'm just but... sitting here thinking with a nurseryman's hat on. Cool, you can make some money out of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say, I... The, there are other people, I mean, you, you've had Joe on podcast two or three times yeah. before. There are other people who do snowdrops so much better than I can. So I, I kind of leave the selling to them. Um, but when you know people like Joe, you do happen to finish up with a, a sort of small collection that is rather bigger than you think it is. Um, <laughs> but I just like ones that do what they should do and they grow yeah. and multiply and flower well my criteria for snowdrops at the moment 
Tim, and I, th I think it will remain so. I mean, I've got quite a collection of them, thanks to Mr. Sharman and Mr. Brian Ellis and lots of other lovely people. Um, John Morley, of course. Um, and, you know, the, the thing is, you get so many that you... You, you've, you, I want to assess the plant before I actually buy another one. Yeah. So I want, to, if possible, to see it growing somewhere, to know whether it's vigorous enough, to know whether it's a good doer. In other words, does it increase? It does it clump up? Because I, you know, I'm fed up with these little things that they get two or three flowers on, and that's your lot. And I have got a couple that seem very, very slow to in, increase. And for me, one of them is called Mother Goose. It's funny, Mother Goose and Treasure Island are two that always look very similar to me, and they're kind of they on. Do. When when they get cheaper and I can find a space to actually plant it, I'll probably get one or eat both of them. But interesting to hear that it's not such a good doer. Well, I wonder because now this might be my fault because I don't know because it's my my, my um, mother goose is in quite a shady area and so is Treasure Island. But having that golden little knob at the top of the flower does that mean that they prefer um, a sunnier position, perhaps? Ooh. Don't they know. certainly go yellower, of course, because I'm extremely uh, lucky. Yes. I was um, was gifted golden fleece, amazingly, <laughs> by, by Dean Croucher, which um, I'm so pleased is flowering because I thought it might. I die. saw it on Instagram, yeah. And it's marvelous. I mean, it's looked better and better. I thought I'd take a photo of it before something happened to it. <laughs> I was just, I've been convinced something's going to happen to it since it was given to me, um, and it's just looked better and better as the little pagoda is kicked out. Yeah. But it, it could do with a bit more sunshine. It's not quite as yellow. <laughs> Similarly. Last year, I bought Wandlebury Ring, which is um, a yellow one, uh, which is they're at the sunniest end of my shade bed. It's the sunniest place I can possibly put them, but it's not really probably as much light as they would want. So they're both not quite as golden as they could be, but still very exciting. I, I have been told that the yellow ones only really get properly yellow on certain soil types. I don't know if there's some oh. mineral they need to develop it or something. Possibly. Um, I've got golden fleece, and I have to say it is very, very golden. And I'm very pleased that I've got nine flowers. I've got eight flowers out at the moment and one bud. Um, and it's strange. It's a strange little thing because not all snowdrops do this, but um, golden fleece seems to produce uh, some flowers, as they normally do. And then there seems to be a second bite of the sherry. So they yeah. put the flowers over a longer period, perhaps. Yeah, I've got one or two that do that. You yeah. get very often two stems from from a bulb come through it seems yes, yes. Um, so that's yeah if your bulb, that's if your bulbs get big and fat enough well yeah you just, just want ones that produce plenty of flour don't you at the end of yeah. the day it doesn't matter whether exactly i mean there must be a mass of bulbs in this pot now i haven't disturbed it for two or three years so um it does look like it now needs splitting up and separating out later this summer but um it's a good display as far as I'm concerned. From a single... It is a good display, but the other trouble you just said is that, you know, in the summer, you tend not to be thinking about snowdrops. <laughs> oh, yeah, we we have a lot of woodland and shade loving things that we start splitting usually in sort of August or so and try and get them done before weather gets too cool. So, um, well, and they make a little bit of growth, too, don't they, then? Yeah, they get done at the same time. Um, but. Uh, it's opened up now. I've brought it in the warmth because it was brilliantly <laughs> shut when I was um, picking it out yesterday. Um, I'm talking of getting newer ones. This was one that I'd heard of for a little while and um, it went on my wants list and finally picked it up last year. And, you know, I bought one bulb last year, two flowers this year. Yeah. I don't know whether you're going to get a good enough. Ooh, yes, you can. Yeah. yeah. A little heart shape. Yeah, not grumpy, but what I think of as kind of super grumpy, it's Gunther Waldorf. It's big and chunky compared to my normal taste in snowdrops. But I'm well, that's bit... what I like. Yeah, you see, I go for the, the smaller, more elegant ones for some reason. Yeah. But, um, and things like Galanthus gracilis are really sort of suit me. But um, now those ones with the delicate and different inner marks, I'm, I'm a bit of a sucker for. So, yeah, it's strange. I bought three new snowdrops last year, and this is the only one which has come through. The other two d decided to rot off on me. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I've not had a lot of luck with new purchases last year, but, um, yeah, it's um, one that I'm very pleased to see doing pretty well, I think, from a single... Well, I mean, if something as vigorous yeah. and as big as that and chunky as that in a nice big clump or a drift would look absolutely stunning. Yeah. 
when people sort of say snowdrops are all the same, uh, I know where they're coming from. I probably said this myself many years so ago. So I. Aside uh, <laughs> yeah. from floral differences, I think increasingly I am really sort of pleased. It pleases my eye to see the foliage differences. And particularly mm. when you get really nice contrasting clumps. Um, there's a lovely planting outside St John's College in Cambridge. And um, David Oster and the head gardener there, I think, must have had some influence. They've got gorgeous honesties uh, interplanted with all these snowdrops. And um, you, you can quite clearly see big strappy foliage, grassy foliage, and you've got more glaucous, more green. And it's lovely. I hope, you know, normal passers-by are stopping and really noting the, the differences. Similarly, at Anglesey Abbey, where I took a stroll the other day, uh, it's just lovely, it was particularly when they clump up and you can really appreciate the, the foliage differences as well. I don't know the name of the one I'm going to talk about, but I don't know, I don't know whether Tim is aware of it at all, but I have seen it growing in a couple of gardens. One was Raveningham Hall, which was the garden of the late Lady Priscilla Bacon, of course, and she she um, was very famous for all the snowdrops that she grew, and now her son, Sir Nicholas, is there with his wife, Susie, and they still carry on the tradition of the snowdrops. And the other place I saw it was in Rosie Steele's garden, and she's a, a plants woman of note he has lots of rare plants and it what it does it's quite a, a low little just a little white bell on the stick on a stick but the leaves curl out and lay flat on the ground and i thought this is a wonderful one for putting in a gravel garden for instance because it you know that attraction that the leaves curl around on the at, at soil level do you yeah. know what i i can picture it but i can't remember what it's called i'm afraid no, i can't either no, um, it is yeah. a nice one. But Rosie, if you're watching this, you did promise me a bulb. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to end up spending some time during the edit trying to figure out what this uh, this bulb is. I can I can imagine. I was just trying to see. I similarly saw a muscari on the internet that did the same thing. Muscari filiform, which had fabulous mm. twisty leaves, which yeah. uh, I'm sure it's. Um, it, very hard to it was a picture in a desert i'm assuming it's very hard to grow and it's not one that you would actually buy and grow in your garden but fab i mean wonderful leaves we always you know so often talk about bulbs for their their flowers but uh, it's always fun if they can have some fun yeah. foliage as well oh well, I'm, I'm heading down that route with the next one so uh, I, I i think arums are at risk does that sound right of becoming the next snowdrop thing or they seem to be on the continent by any account so perhaps not so much in the uk yet but um i think you're absolutely right because i went to see somebody in his garden the other day and they'd got a good and lovely collection of patterned leaves like you're holding tim yeah. and nearly all of them had german names in actual fact right. yeah i i haven't picked up i don't think i've got any german ones yet but i'm i'm sort of picking up one or two new ones each year, it seems, at the moment. But yeah. I try not to just go over the same old ground all the time. Because you've got, um, what are we supposed to call it now? Aerometallicum marmoratum, I think is yeah. its, its correct current name. That's yeah. been around for decades. And it's in a good form. It's a really good plant still. But do we need 20 new versions of the same thing? Um, so I'm trying to get distinct ones. Um, and this is one which I've, I've actually had for quite a long time. Um, it's got exactly the same patterning on as as the ordinary marmoratum. My light is just shining horribly off it, so you can't really see it. But um, the key thing is its size. Yeah. And, I mean, this is a, a good size bulb in this pot. So talking of bulbs with foliage rather than just flowers, I always miss the flowers on these arums because there's so much else going on at the time of year when they flower. But this is arum metallicum tiny and it is tiny and very slow compared to. Any Make other. your hands look huge. Well, I mean, I'll admit they're not small, but <laughs> yeah, it's not a big plant at all. Um, I mean, it's what is it? I suppose four or five inches tall, 10, 12 centimeters. Yeah. And it doesn't really get any bigger than that. Um, the Have you ever part... heard of the um, Aaron called um, Primrose Warburg? Yes. Um, the, there's somebody who's promised me a bit of that as well, but not in Norfolk, but. Um, <laughs> Yes, well, I've, I have... I've got I've got one, Tim. So you you can earmark yourself for a little bit of that at some point because I only got it last year, but I put it in a pot, and I yeah. said to the gentleman that gave it to me, I mean, do you grow this outside? And he said, Well, I've tried it twice and I've lost it twice. Okay, um, but I mean, well, it's but... been in a pot and it sits in my kitchen courtyard, so it gets pretty cold. Um, yeah. But it's perfectly all right at the moment. But it's lovely patterning on the leaf. 
Yeah, yeah, it's it's very tempting that one. The garden I've seen it in is in in Lincolnshire, and I'm pretty certain it's been in the ground there for quite a while. Right. And so, drained soil. Yeah, I think see, you, that you, fills you, me with optimism. Good yeah, chance one, where you are. There's one less part to water. <laughs> yes, quite. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I've had this eighteen years or something now, and I've still only got about eight or ten bulbs of it. So it doesn't bulk up anywhere near like all the others do. Yeah. Um, so I don't know that it will ever be widely available as such. Um, but it's a lovely, neat little plant anyway. Yes, yeah, it is. Lovely. And yeah. actually, certainly, if you plant your snowdrops as I do, which is sort of in a raised bed so that I can really get up close and look at them, a, a tiny arum would be very useful because I've currently mm. got a um, monk silver, which is fab, but yeah. it's boisterous you know huge leaves they're glorious but i haven't got that much space so yeah. <laughs> then you're sort of thinking well i need to lose this leaf really because there's a snowdrop underneath and i now can't see the snowdrop under the leaf so a little yeah. one would be perfect for my bed i kind of went yeah. for the wrong arum oh you you don't need another one i just picked up oh was it yeah it must have been last year called curtis's giant then because <laughs> that that makes monk silver look pretty tiny <laughs> <laughs> was it called curtis's giant Curtis is giant, yeah. Yes, but if you've got 32 acres, that's exactly what you need. Yes, I'm, I'm <laughs> sure you can squeeze it in somewhere, Alan. <laughs> yes. Back to flowers then. Um, I used to grow loads of pulmonarias. And, yeah, I mean, late 90s, early 2000s, they were popular and we, we sold quite a lot of different varieties. But for whatever reason, I hate admitting to fashion in plant sales, but it's true, it happens you get to the point where people just won't buy something and growing 30 different varieties or whatever we had, you're just wasting time and money potting the things up. So we let our pulmonary collection dwindle quite considerably through the sort of early 2000s. And I'm now trying to get some of them back again because there seems to be a bit more interest. But it's interesting how pulmonary live and you get some that just keep on going and you don't yeah. do anything to them. They're still there. And others that disappear as soon as you turn your back on them. <laughs> and I think this has been one of the most reliable for me over the years. Um, stick. I need something pale to stick behind it. I've got try and find a bit of paper. Not got too much written on it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Hopefully you can see a better idea of what that looks like instead of against my mossy green top. Um, this is pulmonaria mollis and it's just got a plain green leaf more or less deciduous but it's been flowering since the beginning of january and wow. it just comes up year in year out does its thing really early flowers i suppose normally over about six or eight weeks and by the middle of the summer you don't notice it it's just this plain hairy green leaf and it blends into the planting with the other things coming through around it um but yeah, I still think there's some good pulmonarias out there that are good, tough, reliable, long-lived things. I have um, all the modern ones. I've, one that does really well for me has got the most hideous, hideous name. They all do. <laughs> Shrimps on the Barbie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but that that's a good a good plant. I mean, it really does do well, as does Diana Clare. Yeah. Um, which yeah. I think was Bob Brown named, named it after his wife, I think. I, I think so, yeah. Yeah, Diana Clare. It was always impressive. Very vigorous one. Yeah. Um, but it petered out on me. Had it in the ground looking really good for five, six years, and then realised it had just gone backwards, and next year it had gone completely. Mm. Uh, as I'm straightforward, Pulmonaria rubra, for example, it just keeps on going and going and going. Um, and it's I think Mollis has been used as a, a parent in some of the modern hybrids where they want that early and long-lasting flower. Um, has not got the most exciting leaf, but um, a really good long don't you, flower. Don't you think it might be a good idea if the RHS did a pulmonaria trial? Now, am I wrong? Wasn't there a pulmonaria trial about? Oh, it could well have been, ago? yes. But maybe it needs updating. Um, well, I'm just wondering because from what you say, Tim, and I mean, you know, you know, because you're growing them and you're a nurseryman, a very good one. Um, but from what you say, I think that it, it sounds as if lots of the modern hybrids. Um, which are lovely when you get them, are not long lived. And if they're not long lived, I mean, they ought to be sorted out so that the general public can have something to judge them by. 
there is possibly a, a sort of technical spanner in the works as to why they're not long lived. It might be down to how they're propagated. Um, ah. A lot of the modern ones will have been done by tissue culture in the lab. Yeah. I don't know if this applies to pulmonaries, but it certainly applies to some other plants from tissue culture in that they don't divide the little plantlets down to singles. They leave them in clusters, which gives you a quicker plant to sell. Yeah. There's definitely some evidence, particularly with things like bamboos, when they were doing bamboos from tissue culture, that those little plantlets that are left in a cluster outcompete each other. And you, you actually have them fighting for space, life, water and everything. And they just don't do very well in the long term. Right. So I wonder if that might be the case with pulmonarias, that mm -hmm. um, they do well to start with, but they, they just squash each other because there's, there's too many individual little plants oh, that's been left be, together. It? it would be worthwhile experimenting, buying a modern one and taking it out of the pot and pulling it to pieces. I mean, having a look at it to see how it grows. And if it if it is a cluster of lots of smaller ones, separate them and then see what happens. Yeah, yeah. It's it's always worth experimenting with something yeah. like that. Mm. Uh, Fascinating. I mean, you know, we're, we're dividing these with a big knife and secretary. Yeah, to chop that's what you want, up. isn't it? Something reliable, something safe. Yeah, good solid plant, that one. Mm. Um, where do we go now? I was going another couple of spring flowers. Um, and I could only find one flower on it yesterday, but it caught my eye in the in the dreary rain. Um, I think I might possibly have shown this before, but slightly moth eaten flower at that. But it is a sign that spring is definitely moving in the plant world. This is Primula Lady Greer. And oh. if I remember correctly, this is a primrose cross oxlip hybrid. Um, it will get a bit bigger than that. That's typical of these ones they start opening flowers with a really short flower stem and as they open more and more the flower stems get taller and taller so it'll get up to six or eight inches tall by the time it's it's in full flower um sometime later next month i suppose um i'm kind of hoping we've got a nice batch of these on the nursery this year and a, a pink similar one called david valentine as well i'm really hoping they're going to be looking reasonably good still in flower when we get to the beginning of april for the dixter plant fair but um if the spring carries on as warm as the last couple of weeks have been they might well have gone by then but i I have, I have such a place in my heart for all the primulas all of the i can't get <clears throat> can't get drawn into auriculars i'm not allowed to do that until i, no. I have way more time but just primroses i just think are, are wonderful i saw you um I don't know if this was a long time ago or recently, you'd posted a photo of a, a barn hate some Barnhaven seed you'd been. Oh, that was a couple, growing. well, yeah, maybe about a week ago or something. And um, that's the other one I've got here is one of the Barnhavens that we've got. Oh. Um, so these came from a um, garden of um, somebody who works for me. Her, her parents have had um, a selection of Barnhavens in their garden for quite a while. And um, yeah, the, the one that I posted on Instagram was... Um, Garnet Cowichan, which is the, the deep garnet red without much of a yellow eye. Um, this is, I'm, I'm a sucker for these blue ones, I really am. Um, but it's got more of an eye to it, this one. I haven't checked on their website to see what they, they call this strain, but I've never seen such a reliable self-seeding blue as these. Um, we've got a few other colours coming along as well, but... Um, yeah, we'll we'll try and get a few more of them propagated because they do seem to have a bit more oomph about them than some of the, the vegetably propagated cultivars that are out there. Well, some of the modern hybrids are absolutely ha awful, aren't they? I mean, you know, you get to the Primula Crescendo hybrids, I mean, Polyanthus type mm. with, with the most ga garishly coloured flowers. But the one thing about the Barnhaven group is they do have some of those lovely soft muted like victorian violets or something whatever they are and there's all the lilacs and mauves and violety colors and if you want to go to the other end of the of the, of the spectrum and please thordis you go to the end with the, the sunshine shades <laughs> <There's> all these <laughs> wonderful bright oranges and and yeah. you know in different shades they 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 actually do have I think a better probably better, better coloring than I tell you what I went to, to a garden in, in our village um, last spring and walking into the garden there was these old polyanthus and they were just like the polyanthus my granny grew mm. slightly smaller flowers 
masses of them, but they were in all the lovely old fashioned sort of shades of reds and oranges and kind of gingery colors and, you know, faded yellows and dirty, dirty yellows and things that I remembered so well. And I just thought, oh, why can't we just have more of these? Yeah. Yeah, well, with any luck, they're not quite out yet, but we should have some some gingery brown Barnhavens coming yeah. through as well. And um, there's some bright mustard yellows, which I will admit are perhaps not quite to my taste, but I'm sure somebody will appreciate them. Well, um, I would. <laughs> and and one one plant came up, um, obviously from, from seed, but um, and it's got this lovely, soft, faded, pinky red colour to it as well. Yeah. Which, fades even more towards the edges of the flower and it perhaps looks a little bit sort of moth-eaten and old at first glance but that's what it's like from the word go like a, a faded old chintz armchair yeah it's that sort of thing yeah yeah so um yeah hopefully um have a few more of those and um we're lucky to have access to some seed of them without having to try and import them from from france now because well i've just had a packet of seed come from germany um wednesday this week but took 10 days to get here and cost me rather a lot more in customs and handling fees than it used to so well, um, do you know what yeah. that makes me think that um i don't know if uh if either of you follow um the the flower farm florette in america which is very famous um you know has a huge following and makes uh, ha has many many flowers in all of the shades that I am drawn to, so I'm always keen to see what they what zinnias or dahlias they're going to share on their Instagram. Mm -hmm. But they have been working on their own seed mix seed mixes, particularly dreamy zinnias uh, with names like unicorn mix, um, <laughs> and uh, they finally you know have, have released them. Uh, they're working for years on this breeding. And uh, and I thought, oh, this is exciting. I mean, you probably won't be able to buy them over here. And then there was a little bit that's like, if you're interested, international buyers, yes, mm. I'm one of those. I'm very interested. <laughs> I clicked on it. And um, obviously, if you were going to buy the seed, you had to do a minimum order of however, hundred, however many hundred dollars and pay for your phytosanitary certificate. I thought, yeah, it's probably not me, actually, after all. <laughs> I, I will not be trying florette flowers zinnia mixes but if anybody gets the seed over here please send some my way because i want to grow these dreamy zinnias in particular oh wonderful things I'll i think when you get when you get businesses like that that you've got to buy a certain amount and there are some seed companies that do that i mean if, if you're a member of a gardening club or a society or anything yeah. well they just get together and do it I can't wait for a grower to get them over here. I mean, they're only just launching in America, so I don't know. It will happen. Um, they've certainly got enough of a momentum on social media that there will clearly be growers who want to to try them. But I might have to wait a few years for them to become affordable and available. <laughs> well, to go along with flowers, of course, I grow a few foliage plants. And we had several I know it. last time I was on on, on the podcast. Um, so I thought I'd bring a few more of my ivies along. Um and I've always grown ivies from mid 90s or so onwards, but um, a few years ago I did expand the collection quite a bit, um, which is handy considering the, the national collection has, has gone from Fibrex. And um, I don't think the people that have taken on Fibrex's pelagonium seem to be doing any of the ivies. So um, I'm, I have to admit, I now have slightly over 100 different ivies. So um, <laughs> there's a few to look at, but. I thought this is a, an interesting one here because um, it, it's at first glance just a plain white cream grey variegated ivy. But it's one of those ones that every time I see it, I think, which one's that? It's just looking a little bit different. And I don't quite know what it is, whether it's the dark pinky red stems, the exact combination of foliage on it. But um, it's definitely one that's been looking very presentable for us since we got it two or three years ago. How do you spell that? It's H E I S E, and it's it's not proving quick or rampant. Um, I say it's putting a bit of extension growth on here, but it's only only going perhaps a, a foot in a season. Um, whereas some of the others I've got are doing sort of four and five feet in a season. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I think it it would probably suit a, a container outside a north door or and it looks like it should climb or scramble quite happily um it's just not going to completely envelop your entire house um so nice one to brighten up a shady spot at any rate lovely yes yeah uh, we like that big yeah. fan of that i'm so pleased you brought ivies 
It was just a few. I mean, you know, you don't want an hour of Ivy's, do you? So <laughs> just, I think I brought about six. Um, and I know this will be a, a real Marmite variegation for people. Um, I can give you a better view on it. It's one of these random streaky, splashy type variegations on this one. Again, it's quite small, compact plant um, called Kaleidoscope, this one. That's um, really up my street. Uh, if that's a Marmite yeah. plant, I'm, I'm on the love it side. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really <laughs> flummoxing the focus on my camera, I think, though, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but yeah. I, just, I mean, I, I look at that and I think, how can somebody not like that? If you go, I mean, you go out to the garden in the middle of winter when there's hardly any flowers, if there are flowers at all, and you look at that, you don't, it doesn't it lift your heart? Well, it's it's funny. With the ivies, I'm getting an absolute 50-50 split. There are customers who are like, ivy, no, kill it, don't put it in the garden. And there are others who are gathering up armfuls of them. There's very little middle ground with the ivies, it seems. Yeah. Um, so you either get them or you don't, I think. Um, but there's there's definitely potential for people not to like certain variegations and this i call it a random variegation compared to a more organized variegation is maybe perhaps a bit hard to take for some folks but no I'm, i can I've see that been... with some i mean even large snowdrops coming through it as a yeah. as an undercover planting or or, or early um well it doesn't have to be early i mean just cream narcissus something like candle power um yeah. You know, they've worked well with that. It looked lovely with that creamy white variegation. I was thinking that some of those bright blue scillas would look good with it. Good idea, well. Tim. Yeah. What about Another that? Option there. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, quite quite nice little one there, Kaleidoscope. Um, talking of more uh, organised variegation, um, and I'm going to mess up the pronunciation of this one because Welsh is not um, a language I'm particularly proficient at, but this is one of the few... Um, gold margined ones that I've found. Um, quite a lot of the yellow variegated ones are, are sort of random spotted and splashed. Um, but this one, you can see it's yeah. got quite a good gold margin to it that, that then fades into a, a sort of creamy colour as the leaf matures as a, an older the leaf. The interesting there. thing about that is when you look at the leaf, you look at the, uh, we're looking at the creamy golden edge, but mm. look at the different shades of green there are in the, in the, oh, with yeah. the chlorophyll part, part of it. Yeah, you, you get, um, that's probably one of the best ones to look at. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, there's about four different colours on most of the leaves. Yeah. Um, and this one, I don't know whether it's just the plant I got of it in the first place wasn't very good. Uh, it's It's been a weak plant so far, but it seems to be starting to get going. Now, you can see it's, it's grown yeah. this, this bit since about August last year, so it's doing something. Well, you know um, what that plant said to you, don't you? Give us a chance, Governor. And you did. Well, I, I'm afraid I stripped it for cuttings and <laughs> I've only got about eight cuttings off it, but they've all rooted and grown away and the, the original plant did rot off. So I, yeah. I think it was probably just a bad, bad example that I got. Um, but this is called Keridwen. My Welsh pronunciation will be completely wrong, but um, not quite sure if it's just a, a name or, or what, but um, not a quick one, certainly so far. Um, the other style of yellow that you can get in ivies, and there's quite a lot of them once you start looking, are the completely yellow ones with no no sort of variegation as such. Um, I've grown, and we mentioned on the last one, Buttercup for years and years and years, and that's probably the most available. But it's funny, when you start getting into a rabbit hole of plants and start researching, you find there's more and more and more. Um, and how deep are you your pockets, Tim? For ivies, that fortunately, uh, unless you start looking at shipping them in from the US, where they've got loads that we haven't here, um, they are relatively inexpensive. Mm. Uh, I mean, I've not paid, what have I paid? I think the most I've paid for an ivy has been about £12, mm. and that was an arborescent type. So they're sods to root at times, they really are. Um, Just to explain for everybody what an arborescent type is. Right, so the, the ivies do this completely two-stage growth habit. You have these ones where they're producing trails and runners and they climb up stuff and carpet the ground, classed as a juvenile stage. And some of them are permanently juvenile and they'll never move on to an adult stage. Others are kind of 
permanently in the adult, upright, bushy fruiting stage where you see the, the flowers in the autumn covered with, well, around here last year, it was mostly ivy bees and wasps on them, but yeah. you'll get all sorts of butterflies and everything on them. And then they produce the berries during the winter that, again, around here just seem to attract all the wood pigeons. And um, doesn't the arborescent growth have slightly different shaped leaves? Usually. Um, oh, that's a big can of worms to open because the leaf <laughs> shape of the juvenile growth is so variable. Um, I've got a couple which sit at this awkward middle ground where they're semi-arborescent all the time. And occasionally they throw more of a traily bit. And occasionally they throw a more woody bit, but they usually sit that sort of bushy middle ground where it's very hard to describe actually what they're doing. Um, so, yeah, the, the arborescent ones, you can, with a lot of them, push them back to juvenile relatively quickly. Um, just by, I, I think growing them in more shade and pruning them quite hard seems to do that. So you can force them to that to make them easier to propagate that particular variety because the, the trails root far better than the bushy growth does mm. um, but pushing a juvenile form to the, its arborescent version can take a lot longer um, but grow them hard grow them in full sun not too much moisture and that seems to push them towards arborescent growth what we're starting to see though is a bit of confusion over naming because um, to me i mean we sell Buttercup in both versions, albeit I don't have many arborescent ones each year. And we just sell it as Buttercup, which is your, your juvenile trailing form, and Buttercup Arborescent, your bushy adult form. But there are some out there, and particularly perhaps more in the States than in the UK at the moment, but there's Heterorhombia variegata, which is a beautiful variegated Japanese species. And that's just called variegator in its juvenile form. In its arborescent form, it's called creme de menthe. <laughs> so we've now got two cultivar names for the same plant. Yeah. And I'm, that just irritates me. Um, it, it shouldn't happen, really. But, um, yeah, there we go. It just makes life slightly more complicated. I guess they think the, the, the nursery people think that creme de menthe sounds rather more attractive. Yeah, maybe. I mean, variegators fairly... The males, well, it shouldn't have been renamed, really. It should just be called variegator arborescent. But yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's very pretty version in, sorry, very pretty plant in both versions. Yeah. Um, but I've I must not... say that, that, you know, you talk, we just, you just mentioned buttercup as probably being the most readily available yellow leafed mm. ivy there is. Now we have yellow, we have buttercup on, on a north facing wall around by our tea room. And I have to say it is a stunning, stunning plant. Now, we're quite dry, and I always worry about the, the plants that don't have quite so much chlorophyll in them with the yellow leaves, for instance, as a philodelpus, and it always gets the leaves scorched every year, however much shade it has in the garden here. And I worried about the ivy, but the ivy doesn't scorch. It is no. actually, I don't know, it may have got its feet into a drain or something. It could well have. Um, <laughs> so there's no shortage of water, but I mean, you know, <laughs> it's a stunning plant, but, you, but we do have to cut it hard back every two or three years. Yeah, yeah, and it's in a relatively tight spot like that, then mm. they will yeah. bush out, and they'll, yeah. like most plants, they'll fill the available space. Yeah, um, well, I wish the poet's ivy would do that. The is it is that is that he, hedera um, helix poetica. poetarum? Yeah, po yeah. poetarum. Yes, that's right. Poetarum. Well, yes, I, 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 we've got one of those in the garden, which is funnily enough beloved by the muntjac. They love um, muntjac. So I haven't got any cuttings to take this year, but last year I did cuttings, and I think I probably got about twelve or fourteen um, of the arborescent growth on it. So, so hopefully we would have some nice golden berried holly dollops. <laughs> I've, I've got that in both juvenile and arborescent forms. So the, yeah. the juvenile form roots really easily and produces masses of cutting material. But I'm then planning on sitting on the young plants of that for however long it takes to push them to go to arborescent and then produce yeah. the burying plants. I do love this uh, discovery that when I, I did know, I did know about uh, juvenile and, and arborescent forms, but I just love how holly, how ivies are so similar to people that some of them are, are juvenile forever. I never, <laughs> I never thought about that before. Yeah. Well, as somebody also mentioned the other week that they reckon that Euonymus fortunii does the same thing. 
and that the, the versions that you normally see in the garden are basically juvenile versions and because they they very rarely produce berries and they they do um but there's there's one in a in village near me that's right on the side of the road that's gone sort of adult and produces masses of these pink berries every year really so yeah i i get what you mean about people i sometimes feel like that still yeah <laughs> you, your brain sticks at a different age to your body i think doesn't it um <laughs> plant, plants it's perhaps more widespread than it was first thought <laughs> Um, anyway, before I get, because um, these plants are all sopping wet, of course, after yesterday, they're all dripping on me fairly. Um, I've, do, I've done the Dan Cooper thing and shoved a towel on my lap today as well. <laughs> but this, this is a little miniature yellow one called Goldfinch. And I don't think you'll be having to chop it hard back every couple of years, this one, because I doubt it's actually going to climb. It's more of a, a low, clumpy, sprawling one, this one. But... I do see the best yellow on these yellow leaf ones when they're in the sun, actually. Yeah. Um, they tend to go greener in the shade, but yeah, nice pinky red shoots on it. And, and then the, the yellow leaves, it will get more yellow as the spring goes on. It's still in the slightly limey green winter mode at the minute. Um, but lovely little compact one at any rate. I'm just sort of thinking, you know, the, the plants that you've 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 shown us so far. I mean, we've got a lovely sort of winter. I mean, a winter quilt, the patchwork, if you like, of, of some of these lovely little ivies, the arums. Add to that some of the evergreen ferns, perhaps. Um, yeah. You've got some lovely winter coverage. Yeah, well, that was that was kind of what I was trying to pick out because yeah. when when you're out giving talks during the winter, as I I have been doing loads of talks to really? garden club and that recently. Um, you want to take a few plants to sell. Mm. I haven't got the time to do talks in the summer when most of the grasses and, and that are doing their thing. So, yeah, I've always accumulated a, a fair selection of things that are looking good flowering or just good foliage in, in the winter as well. Um, but I've always I mean, had... I think one of, the yeah. things that, one of the things that has happened, it's, it happened naturally here, and we had a log pile in the shade, and I photographed it for Thordis the other day, and it's absolutely covered in mosses. Um, yeah. And I'm just sort of thinking that combination that I just talked about, you know, the the arums and the ibis and some ferns. Why not, you know, small piles of logs covered in moss and things as well. Yeah, well, very we've... attractive, natural looking landscape type gardening, we've but lovely. Gone round cutting our shelter belt and windbreak hedges earlier this well this month last month, and instead of cutting it all off to a burn heap now we've put a lot of it underneath the shelter belt stacked up in heaps and, and that. Yeah. And we first put some under there just last winter and they've already turned into lovely mossy log heaps in just one yeah. year. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And, and I mean, think of the benefits to, to the natural world from doing that as well. And, yeah. and just to say, I mean, this is probably a stupid idea, but I didn't feel like I had the room to, to do that. Um, and so I, I sort of, I'd like to say artistically, I'm not sure that was right, but I sort of artistically placed <laughs> the odd uh, cutting, like, you know, a bit of a uh, bit of branch that had been cut off in my shade bed so that plants could grow around. It. And so I had a little bit of that um, woody uh, habitat, I suppose, but I couldn't do a whole pile. And I think you can do that if you've got a very small garden, you can sort of go microcosm the habitat a little bit and hopefully provide some of those opportunities. So I think it looks quite nice when your plants are coming up around some fallen timber in yes. a small scale well, a few years ago we we took a, a silver birch down on the nursery because it, it was it was meant to be a one of the very pendulous ones and it it became rather too pendulous and started looking a bit dangerous so it hadn't got very big but it had got a trunk that i suppose was it was a good five or six inches thick and i thought well it's a shame to lose that so i cut it into a, a sensible couple of lengths and used it to edge one of the woodlandy borders in the in the display garden on the nursery at the time. I know it rotted away after sort of six or seven years, but it just looked right with these, yeah. these plants around it. So it didn't take up much more room than any other sort of edging would have done. Um, in, just... in fact, um, talking, I mean, it's a, it's a, if you've got the material, it's obviously a great money saving way of, of keeping, you know, you're saving energy, you're saving miles, you're saving money by using the material within your own garden. And I know that Joe Whitehead, head gardener at Burley, they do that. They're obviously 
have a, a lot of material in the parkland that they they're cutting back and then they use that to edge the paths they chip stuff to put on the paths so you know, obviously alan's doing stuff like that all the time at east Ruston as well yeah it's, it's can, recycling isn't it yeah, yeah it's, it's great recycling, isn't it? and i mean if, you, if you've got a woodland garden that we have here um you know you've got chip wood bark chips or wood you know any twigs that you put through the shredder, shredder and things like that i mean they go on the paths i mean i know they probably take nitrogen out of the soil as they rot down but the other benefit from it in a funny sort of way is the fact that you get lots of these kind of very colorful fungi mushrooms and whatever toadstools whatever they are i don't know what they all are but some are, i mean some are very very blue some are very bright red i mean they're all interesting and it's just another part of nature you know we see that all the things are growing in the spring well in the autumn all those sort of things are growing on the rotting mess that's underneath the ground or there somewhere um and it's 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 part of the whole cycle of life isn't it to sort of you know from a living thing to a dead thing and it's feeding other organisms on the way and those are organisms are helping the the wood to rot down to go back into the soil yeah it's also a good predator habitat for a lot of things as well and think of all the, the ground beetles and centipedes that we find under yep. the the sort of messy piles in the corner and they're hopefully going around eating things that you don't want in the garden it's a bit so. like lifting a stone when you're a child and finding all these creepy crawlies underneath it yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Put, pull a big big log up and find a multitude of centipedes and ground beetles and that scuttling off yeah yeah, yeah. And it's so um, i find um much, because so. i i feel like you know this garden was had nothing in it when i i came my allotment was i think he'd just grown potatoes the previous person i have had never had seen so many volunteer potatoes in my life and then someone <laughs> said oh that's because he just grew potatoes there for, for years <laughs> he was obsessed oh. with potatoes and um and i don't know if it ever got mulched or anything when you put the effort in I find it so rewarding when you start finding all of these organisms turning up. I was rifling, you know, rifling around in the soil at the allotment and there were all like little millipedes and things moving around. And I don't remember there being much in it at all when I was working at last year. So it's um, you feel like it's all happening. You know, nature is responding to what you're giving it. Yeah, can can happen surprisingly quickly as well. Yeah, yeah it does. it's marvellous. Yeah. Last ivy, then I saved the the big thuggy looking one till last. I can <laughs> almost hide behind this one. Look, um, and I can try and get this one somewhere so that you can see the veining on it. Is that yeah. working? Um, and I this, saw the veining on a dark green leaf. Yeah, and it's it's not quite your typical ivy shaped leaf either. It's tending towards a bit more sort of rhomboid sort of shape rather than the the three pointed lobing that you usually get. And it produces some some more lobed ones as well. But um, this is an interesting plant, which I, I first got for a sort of technical, boring botanical reason, rather than because it was pretty, and then discovered it was a really pretty plant afterwards. And this is Hedra hibernica, um, which gets called the Irish ivy, but I always feel slightly uncomfortable calling it Irish ivy because it grows all down the western coast of the British Isles, not just Ireland, but you'll find it down the west coast of Scotland, Wales, and down in Devon and Cornwall as well. And I think from memory, it's found down the Atlantic coast of France, Spain, Portugal as well. Um, so it's very, very similar to our normal Hedrohelix, but just a little bit different. Um, the key thing made me buy this one though, was I bought it from um, somebody who we all know, Richard Hobbs, and it's the type form from the Edinburgh Botanic Garden. So this is a vegetably propagated plant from the original defined plant of Hedra hibernica. Um, now, I've never had a vegetably propagated plant from a type specimen before. And it's it's just an oddity, really. It's the sort of thing that my brain likes the, the thought of having. But it turned out to be a stunning garden plant as well. Um, usually forms of Hedra hibernica are almost indistinguishable from helix but this is definitely a very distinctive form and I keep thinking it looks like some of these really desirable Asian woodlanders that people pay vast sums for but at the end of the day it's just an ivy um, pretty vigorous one it's, it's putting three feet extension growth on a year it will climb perfectly well it will spread and give good ground cover 
But if you give it a hard prune a couple of times a year, you could grow it as a really nice container plant and it will cascade over a big pot or something mm. as well. Um, oh, so. so many ideas. Oh, I'm, no, just, I'm just, just thinking that when you were mentioning ivies in containers in, in a previous conversation about another ivy earlier on today, that, you know, people that they, they like to go to reclamation yards and places like that and they probably buy a chimney pot. Yeah. I've got several chimney pots. <clears throat> but if you get a tall, narrow chimney pot and you sink it into the ground and then fill it full of soil, I, I mean, an ivy cascading out of that is wonderful. I mean, they'd make lovely uprights in the garden we were discussing a little while ago, wouldn't they? These little yeah. uprights of ivy. To, yeah, really, it's really good. Really quite tolerant of limited water as well. So they do yeah. suit growing in that sort of position. But rather than fill the chimney pot full of soil, what I would do is grow it in, I mean, this is in a fairly straight-sided plastic tub here. It's a, a decent-sized pot. I'd find a plastic pot that will sit inside your chimney pot and put a pile of bricks or something like that in the bottom of it to get the height right, and then just sit a plant in a pot inside it instead. It's, um, well, it saves the chimney pot from getting damaged so easily, but it just makes it a lot easier to manage if you want to take the plant out and do any work to it. Um, Absolutely. Or something. You're a clever old devil, aren't you? I've, I've learned the hard way with broken <laughs> terracotta things. That's that's what. I'll tell you what, another good use for chimney pots, stand them on a piece of, you know, on, a fl on the floor of your greenhouse or your potting shed. And because they're fairly upright and, and, and not wide, they're excellent for putting bamboo canes in. Ah. And it keeps them all together and they don't splay out. I've just got a boring old plywood box I knocked up yeah. in a hurry one day. <laughs> that is a good idea. I tell you what, also, if you happen to just have chimney pots knocking around, which in, in honesty, I don't. But if you do, um, Alan, I know that you've um, you've used it to showcase a certain spring bulb pot or something. You know, you kind of yeah. assume it's yeah. in the top. But they, they are, and things. They, those, those two chimney pots that you're talking about, they're in, in the greenhouse border. And they are exceptionally tall. I mean, they are, I, I don't know, five feet tall, I suppose, something like that. Exceptionally tall for a chimney pot. I mean, you'd, you'd find it hard pushed to use those to store bamboo canes in, I think. <laughs> but very good for displaying your spring bulbs. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Hey. Tim, do you want to go and say hello to no, you're comfy. You're probably quite toasty because you're about to go out and you're in all of your big outfit. Oh. Grown. Uh, hey, hello. Don't hello. cry just because you've got a beard. He's <laughs> up. He's having a bit of a an anti bearded men phase where if he he even went to say hello to a man when we were at Angsy Abbey the other day and the man said hello back and he went yeah. it's just a question of whether you look straight up my nose or get a better angle on it though. <laughs> but that's I mean that works for us if that works for is that, oh, I think is that okay. I that looks good. I think Mr. Grey is joining us a slightly steeper angle on it so if it suddenly shows you the ceiling it's gone too far all right that can go in the bloopers that'll be fine <laughs> right let's try and oh, oh there he is alan gray is connecting to audio Hello. there we go you look very I smart look good. morning alan morning tim how are you ready and raring to go 